Good evening, everybody. It's Mike here from Faraday Research. It is Friday night. It's July 26, 2024. Welcome to the show. Welcome to League of Extraordinary Inventors. I'm your host, Mike. Uh, somebody's got their volume up, and I can hear myself twice. Um, That's fine, me. I got it. Yep, no problem. Yeah, welcome to the show. It's Friday night. It is almost halfway through our summer here. Uh, hard to believe that the summer is uh, just trucking along. And also, uh, my guests and myself, we've been trucking along with our experiments and um, innovations that we've been working on for God knows how long. I know I've been at it for a few years, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, yeah, we got... Um, uh, we got Philip on. He's from Montreal. We got Nathan. Nathan, where are you? What state are you from? California. Oh, you're in California. Okay, cool. And uh, we got Ben. Where Ben? Where are you from? I don't know if he's around the. Is he there? Hello, Ben. <laughs> Hello, Ben. I'm currently in Michigan. Sorry, I had. Oh, you're in Michigan. Michigan. Oh, you okay? You're not that far from me. And I'm just outside of Toronto. And uh, yeah, so we got um, both uh, both sides of the border on tonight. Two Canadians and two Americans. There you go. <laughs> Very good. The, the alliance. <laughs> <laughs> These days, I think we need an alliance the way uh, our governments are screwing up with everything, right? Yeah. So, oh, yeah, let's, and uh, let's not talk about hockey right now. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> and we have Lulu. She's from uh, Hello. Houston. Actually, I'm in Fort Lauderdale yeah, right now. Oh, oh, you're in, oh, that's right. Yeah, you went yes. to Florida. Yeah, yes. Right, right. But I cool, couldn't cool. leave you guys hanging. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right on. All right. So let's. Um, yeah, uh, Philip, uh, do you have any updates for us on what's happened in the last week? Um, well, um, no, no major updates. But uh, actually, I need to. Um, Remember my uh, my experiment is at a laboratory, professional laboratory right now. Awesome. All that, but uh, I just need to pay for it now. But yeah, um, I'm just uh, running short a little bit on cash. But um, you should... know what? That seems to be the theme with every single inventor I've ever known is money. <laughs> that always yeah. seems to be the thing that kind of holds us back sometimes. Uh, I've got uh, so money. I, I've got money, but I got like big time bills to pay every month. And oh, for sure, especially if you're running your own business, right? You know, exactly. you got your you got your overhead costs, hydro, whatever. You know, yeah, and then your the, rental of your uh, of your the accountant, uh, the lawyer, and, uh, right, all <laughs> that stuff, and that costs money, right? It, wow. it costs money. Yeah. Irregardless mm -hmm. at what level of an inventor are you, if you're a backyard inventor like myself and Nathan and uh, a lot of people out there or the guys that are really kind of going to what Philip's doing, uh, getting like real contracts and real things going. So but, yeah, um, it's not, it's not an easy road, right? Yeah. But uh, for fortunately, uh, fortunately, I, did, 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 did you know that the, uh, the grants, the Canadian grants kind of sucks for innovative businesses, but we can apply for U.S. grants as well. Did you know that? You can. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we can. So that's what I'm going to do. We're talking because Canadian grants, it's always like, oh, we're going to pay like 30% or 50% of your expenses. Yeah, it's, that's where Canada's always lacked, you know, trying to fund, you know, like yeah. upcoming engineering and you know, yeah, they, stuff they, that could really push forward, you know. Exactly. So, they, they don't yeah, want to take any risk. That that's the thing. They don't wanna they don't wanna take risk and but you watch you watch the US, they give you they give you like uh, they're gonna give you like uh two hundred and fifty thousand for the for phase one and a uh, five hundred thousand for phase phase two and it can be unlimited right. for uh, phase three depending on the department. So it's, yeah. Well, it, it depends what sector you're really inventing stuff for. If it's military stuff, oh my god, like sky's the limit. There is there is no bottom to the pit, right? Yeah, well, you and I are doing are doing exactly that. So we we need to take advantage of it for sure. Yeah, because like you know, like my day job, you know, working for a military contractor, you know, like the company is making obscene amounts of money, like crazy amounts of money, and it's in U.S. dollars too. 
because our parent company is American. So we're the Canadian division of the American company. So uh, yeah, we're not like in like the small players category. We're in the, with the big guys. So yeah, we're talking, awesome. we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so, awesome. so uh, yeah, like uh, in the next, like at our shop right now, we're getting a new machine put in. Uh, it's coming in, I believe, from Switzerland. It's two and a half million dollars US. Oh my God. Nice. They had, they had to dig a hole in the ground, 10 feet deep, 30 feet wide, and 40 feet long. Wow. It cost the company over 300000 to pour the foundation for the new machine. Whoa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're about half done now. They're doing all the rebarb and all that kind of stuff. And then mm -hmm. the new machine gets shipped in from overseas on a big uh, tanker and comes in probably about three pieces. So as far as I've been told, the machine's about 45 feet long. And huh. weighs about 400 tons. So, oh, wow. yeah. So we're talking huge military scale machining. Yeah. So we're we're with the big guys. Yeah. What what is and, it supposed to do? Uh, it's a five axis CNC machine. Nice. Yeah. And it's made in Europe, so it's even more expensive. So it's actually custom made for the application that we're going to be doing, which I can't discuss. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, the um, so yeah, the, the the funding is way much more generous in the United States, and the uh, you know, I don't know the conditions, all the conditions of what we need to do if we are outside the United States, but I, I guess it's uh, uh, they, they're gonna invite you down the road to move to the United States, but that's gonna be easy for me since I got friends living like there. Like even, um, you know, like when they hired me for the job, they say, would you be willing to travel to the U.S. if you have to? I said, well, I guess, yeah, you know, I want the job, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it took me almost a month to get all my security checks, so it's pretty intensive for the uh, security checks, and it's also done uh, uh, with the international partners as well, so that that's why it takes so long to get all the security. So NATO mm -hmm. NATO is at a high security rate. So <laughs> the, yeah. the, the credit credit score is part of the the background. Yeah. Credit, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that is. It is. They check everything. <laughs> yeah. They almost want oh. your firstborn for crying out loud. Yeah. No, I'm dead oh, serious. Like like Monday, perfect example. I got to go for a physical for the company. <laughs> yeah, I got to go get a medical check done as well. Oh, yeah. So I no, got to do that on Monday. So that'll kill my, much of my Monday morning. So yeah, I have to do it. Yeah, it's a union shop, right? It's a steel workers union in there. So I have to do it. So mm -hmm. it is what it is. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I've been around this stuff for so long. I just don't even think about it. I've been in aerospace, you know, done stuff for military, uh, international, like, um, uh, carriers like Boeing and um, uh, Bombardier and a whole whack of them. And, yeah. you know, whether it's military or civilian, you know, aerospace stuff, I've been there. So, yeah, so it, it's a huge industry. I've been around, you know, machine shops pretty much ever since I started working, really. I started, yeah. you know, I was 22 years old working in my first machine shop. So well, that, that's know, why you... So, that's why you're so motivated to, uh, to solve it, it, Well, it's changed over the years, right? Like, it was like, well, when you first get out, you're young and green behind the years and inexperienced. You're you're going to go through a few jobs, right? But yeah. the thing was, back in those days, in the you know early to mid-90s, um, you know, you could lose one job today and have a new job the next day almost right away like you could snag a job that fast yeah especially but, uh, if you especially if you're young too they'll take all the young guys in right so now yeah. i'm in my early 50s and you know it, it's an entirely different situation now you know the you know the jobs aren't as fruitful as they used to be you know there's companies coming and going all the time like i work for 
two companies in a row and both of them went bankrupt. <laughs> so, you know, like, it, like the last job I was at, I was really happy with the job. You know, the pay could have been a little better, but I was happy. It was stable while I was there. And then right after Christmas, they give me my notice that they put me on layoff. I said, what the heck's going on? They get all the contracts we had basically we either were put on hold or got thrown out the window. Right. So that company is um, in dire straits right now. They actually sold the building off. The one owner basically took the $20 million he got for the building and buggered off and left the other guy standing with the, with the rest of the bill. Oh yeah. Wow. So he's out of the picture. They got the they still have the building, but now they're renting it out. They don't own the building. The building was uh sixty three thousand square feet. It was a fair size shop, right? Yeah. Nice. So that guy pocketed twenty million dollars off that building and basically buggered off. Wow. Said, See you guys. Uh -huh. He was out of there. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. And he helped build that company. That's the crazy part. He was one of the founders of that company. So that was yeah. kind of odd. So I think he kind of seen the writing on the wall. It, it, remind, it reminds me of Michael Copeland of Corel Corporation back in 2000. Mm. You, you heard about it? He, uh, briefly, kind of, briefly. Yeah. He uh, screwed his own company when Microsoft invested into uh, uh, his company. He, he knew that the... Uh, he resold his stock knowing, uh, in fact, that was in 2000, he resold his stock knowing that it was going to go down, but, um, you know, you can't, you can't um, <clears throat> sell your stock when you know uh, private information ahead of the other ones. It's so, insider uh, trading. Yeah, that too. Well, you know, look, look at what happened in Nortel, right? Yeah. And what was yeah, that yeah. other one? There was a big American company that had a Enron. scandal. Enron. Yeah, the yeah. Enron scandal. Yeah. So, you know, what What I see happening in the future is, you know, there will be the big corporations, but I see a lot of small uh, enterprise, you know, small businesses uh, rising up. Yeah. Not necessarily growing to the point of, you know, like Boeing or NASA or anything like that, but small businesses run by just very few people and you know i think still you're being, right on that i i think so too um i've been kind of watching the trends like you're seeing a lot of these small startups where guys come yeah. up with a great idea they put it together they rent out a small office to run their business and a lot of them it. a lot of them seem like they're not run like conventional businesses no you know, that they're trying new things and i like that yeah new things and just a new um perspective on how to run a business for not sure. with the not with the uh, bullhorns capitalistic uh, um, intentions, right? You know, we got to make a hundred million. By well, the I always this thought, year, you know, I always felt like if you're running a business, you're trying to provide a service, you know, and and you should be focused on the service as well as trying to make profit for the company, right? And yeah. you see a lot of companies, they just don't focus on the service anymore. They don't even care. They're making the money. Why should they? Mm. But it's not like a part of their business model, you know, like I, I want to provide a service. I want to help people. You know what I mean? I want to make sure my service is useful to humanity. Yeah. And I think that's the, the, the difference now is with people that start these things. They want to um, make a change in the world, so something to contribute to us getting better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Leave not, the world not... a little bit better than you came into mm. it, you know? Um, but um, yeah, but uh, the this is gonna come from the United States, not from Canada. Because did you know the the patent application rate dramatically dropped in Canada recently? So we don't we uh, we kind of uh, we have a drop here, a major drop in uh, innovations, unfortunately. So. Yeah, because, you know, the liberals, they spent all this money on stupid, excuse my language, shit. Yeah. And now we got, haven't got hey, a yeah. pot to piss in. <laughs> now we don't have a pot to piss in because yeah. of it. And it doesn't matter who takes over, uh, say, the conservative win the next election. You know the shit pot he's got to fix now? 
the, the um, damage is already done. It, the damage is done. It's yeah. done. Like the how we're just all over. You know, well, and not only that, everybody forgets. Like they never really rectified what happened in two thousand eight with the housing crisis. No, they're they still didn't. selling subprime mortgages as prime and yep. repackaging them. And right now, we're, <laughs> right now here in Canada, we're on the verge of that crash. Right now, it's been going on rampant after two thousand and eight in Canada. Right oh, wow. now, especially yeah, so you, especially you in the Toronto that. area, um, we're looking at a huge uh, real estate crash probably within the next year. It's already mm -hmm. starting now. There's a lot of foreclosures and uh, bankruptcies and consolidations and all that stuff happening here in the, in the, you know, in Ontario. I'm not sure about out west or out east, but I know Toronto's starting to well, get hit. Is because you of guys all... might be on the front end of that bubble, you know. Well, yeah, we're you know whatever happened in the U.S. is happening here mm -hmm. in Canada. It might take a few years more for it to happen we're about oh you know, are you saying that it's it's a, a latency for the bubble like you yeah. guys are just experiencing yeah. what we experienced in 2008 yeah exactly yeah. so we're getting very close to that so you know a house here in toronto right now of uh, say like a three-bedroom uh two-story house will run you about 1.2 to 1.8 million oh. okay that's crazy even yeah. in canadian doll even in canadian dollars Oh my like God. there's homes, there's homes in my area where I live right now going for 1.3 million. I don't okay. remember the exact from yeah. the amount, but like minimum wage, you can't make that in a lifetime. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, in Ontario, especially with our, our food costs, um, you know, gas and all our utilities and housing, you sure, have to be, you, you have to be making excess of $35 an hour to make yeah. a decent living. If you're right, not, yeah. you're struggling. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. And a lot of people don't realize, like, I, I make decent money as a construction tech, but I'm still struggling, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, same with us. Like, we're stable, right? You know, the, you know, both of us make decent wages. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're surviving. We're able to go out and do stuff and travel a little bit. But we have to watch our money, too. You yeah. Know, we can't it's just... precarious. Do, we, yeah, we just can't go, you know, crazy because... Right now, they say the average Canadian right now is about eight to twelve thousand in debt. Average, wow. average. That's a national. Look, average. I mean, look at all the student loan debt we have in, in the United States. Same, That's same here. Same here. A perfect yeah. example. My brother's daughter. Okay, she went did uh, six years at Guelph University, which is just uh, west of me. Uh, she was going for a PhD there. She finished six years there. Now she moved to Ottawa. She lives in Ottawa now. And she's doing another six years there to get her PhD in, in the medical wow. industry. So that's 12 years of university. 12 years. Over 100 I like to remind thousand. people that student debt never existed before. You know, we're, we're some of the first generations that are experiencing student debt. Um, well, it's been around since the, you know, the eighties, you know, the, there was a lot of student loans. True. You know? Yes. The late eighties. Yes. When it started to happen, like, but I'm just saying like before that there was no student debt. Like you can go to community college and, and pay right. like 10, $15 a class. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. The, <laughs> the, the central banks again, they, they make profit off the interest rate. And, now uh, the, here's the, here's the irony of all. Okay, you might get all this education, years and years. Okay, of education, it does not guarantee you a job at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't. It doesn't. Exactly. So now you've gambled away a hundred plus thousand dollars. Um, I like that word education. you use, gamble. It is. It's a risk. It is. A, a it risk. is a risk. Sure. Now we have a thing here in Canada. We call it the RESP. It's a, a savings fund we do for our kids. We invest into the Canadian mutual funds, and that money is held in trust for our kids' um, uh, education fund. And then after, uh, when my daughter is ready to go to college or university, I can withdraw that, and whatever I put in, the government gives, I think, 30% more on top of that, That's which, a good is, deal. which is a pretty good deal. So provided that our market, our mutual funds in the stock market are doing well, then my daughter's education fund will climb up faster. If they take a nose 
dive, then I'm starting to lose money on my daughter's education fund, which I don't like, and it makes me very uncomfortable. So there again, you're still doing a gamble, right? You're gambling with your kid's college fund with a mutual fund. So, Crazy. you know, I'm doing that for my daughter right now. She's only 12, but, you know, she's probably going to need that in about six, seven years from now uh, to choose. You know, she's going to go to college or university and she's going to need that money. So, well, but in, in, you know, in the United States, the, uh, the university is still much, um, much more uh, expensive than in Canada. I know in uh, the U mm -hmm. University of California chain, It's like forty thousand per 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 year per, per, per year per, 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 per year. That's right. U.S. For forty thousand dollars per semester. The economy is the economy is rapidly changing, so you know you don't know what the atmosphere is going to be like. You know when she's actually going to college, so preparing early is kind of like a necessity. Yeah, it's a must. You have to. Yeah, wow. most definitely. Well, so, it, out, you yeah. know, like, you know, my daughter says she wants to get into animation. We have a Walt Disney College um, uh, south of where I live. Uh, it's part of the Sheridan College Network, uh, actually part of the UFT University of Toronto. So Walt Disney bought out this facility that's uh, just south of where I am. They dumped, I don't know how many millions into this place, and they did Jurassic Park there. They did Terminator there, uh, Toy Story. They did a whole bunch of animation at this school. So she wants to get into that. So back at that time when, I, when that school was just getting taken over by Walt Disney, there was an eight to 12 year waiting list to get into that program. And 90% of it was foreign students from China or Japan wow. or so. Now things are kind of changed. Now the government's kind of cut that off. And that it actually created a big uproar here about a year ago about, you know, the schools. They say that they're losing money because they can't bring in all these foreign students. So well, they we, would Americans rather, need jobs, you know? Well, the other th well, this is the whole point of what I'm saying is they mm -hmm. rather take a foreign student from, say, China or Japan or Korea into our country and then my daughter has no chance of getting into that college because they want those foreign students to come in and bring their money in yeah so right. it, so it was a big yeah it uh, makes it hard rigmarole going on with the government and how they're going to control how many uh, migrant stu students come into the country right well, so, I, I had a, I had a few ideas i wanted to to say Uh, you guys were talking about investors earlier. I couldn't respond because the kids were all around me, so I couldn't say anything. Well, he, I found an investor here in Houston that does not know anything about, you know, anti-gravity, is willing to uh, invest like $100,000, uh, uh, you know, for phase one to see what this whole thing is about, you know. And then he said if he thinks that it's a good idea that he's willing to open up like an unlimited investment. Um, it's part of this called the Expo... Uh, Houston Expo code launch and uh, they already like invested uh, you know I went to one of they invited me to one of their shows and I went there and these guys like invested big money on the participants and you know the participants that were participating if, if you only were there you would like go like this to yourself like it's the stupidest ideas that they gave money to <laughs> you know yeah, i think we're starting to see a change in attitude with investors in this like free energy and anti-gravitics you know all this fringe science where we're starting to see a breakthrough of people actually being more open to it i think yeah yeah because for him it, it was like he's never heard of what the, what anti-gravity is he was like he was very interested and he gave me his card yeah. And he's like, if you, you know, you can gather uh, your group and, a, you know, a bunch of people and pitch it to me. He's like, I'm, I'm willing to invest that money, you know, just to start you guys up to see what, what the whole, you know. Yeah. About. Hey, so, let's, let's right. put together a presentation for him. I'll put together a video okay. or something with you guys, you know, yeah. put together a nice presentation. Okay. That's, that's an, uh, yes, I will, uh, next I'll prepare his business card for next time and his name and his contact. So, you know, we can get that started. Uh, another thing, if we do want real quick money, there is a, a like a way to do it. If we build a small shopping center and we lease out a fifty-one percent, it doubles like five times folds. So if oh, you wow. like, yeah. So if, if it's like you build a shopping center, let's say worth two hundred thousand dollars, and mm. you lease fifty-one percent of it, 
you're automatically already like in the $2 million of value. So yeah, because you know, it's not just real estate. That's, uh, this, you know, <laughs> and this is safe because banks <laughs> will give you loans if you have 20% of that money. So really, mm -hmm. if you, it, 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 let's say if you build a shopping center uh, worth like $200,000, if you have 20% of that money, the bank will loan you the rest. So 20 wow. out of 200,000. So we need like 40 to $50,000. They'll loan us the 200, the, the rest of the money. Huh. You know, yeah. what I always wondered is, are we able to like uh, pool together small business loans? Like say we have three different people with three small business loans approved by a bank. Can we pool those together? Is that possible? We should. Or is that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I thought about that because one one small business loan might not be enough, but if we have a group of people who are all approved, we can pool our resources together like that. Yeah, I mean, I I know a lot of bankers here that will invest in real estate, but won't invest in like you know just concepts or ideas. But if I say, hey, mm -hmm. you know, here's a piece of land, or this is a shopping strip that's for sale, that, you know, needs to be. Uh, fixed up a bit we need the loan they'll give us like a a you know the money and to uh fix it up too so it's not just yeah um yeah i i know quite a bit of bankers you know here you, you know when you work in the medical uh management like mm. all the banks want to come and lend you money but you know i'm just the management but the the doctors right. are the ones that you know need to but i throughout the no, year that's a good idea lot, as as much as I hate to admit it, my idea of raising funds was like selling the rodent coil frames, but I don't think that's going to cut it. That's not going to raise enough money. That's pennies, you know, to the real estate. Yeah, right? that's pennies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, just um, it's not. But when you compare it to the real estate, it scales down like to pennies. If you really want to make good. Right. Like, you, you, it's like money, real money and then money that you'd you have to eat. grind a lot. You know, and money yeah. that you keep, like, remember, there's always, uh, it's building, you know, uh, real estate also, like, you know, you, you, that money's not going away, you know, like you pay back into right. your loan and it's yours. There's like, yeah, at the end of the day, if uh, the tenants, whoever is leasing from you, they're paying lease. So that money mm -hmm. is going into your principal, you know, and the principal is building up. So at the end of the day, you have equity, you know, like you're building equity into that, that real estate it's not yeah. you know so and if you yeah. lease it out you, it, it, like like literally it multiplies by five multiplies by five wow. uh, here a lot of uh, no that's a good idea i a like lot that of developers and business like you know builders will buy something like you know worth like a million dollars and the, the, all they have to do is like come up with two hundred thousand They'll buy something worth a million dollars, lease out 51% and all automatically it's worth between five to $7 million, like, you know, within months. And all they had to invest was like 200 grand, you know, it's, it's crazy, but it, it, it is what it is. That's what, you know, real estate is. Um, now talking about the kids college fund, see, I, I, I saved for my kids college fund, like $250,000, but the problems with this. The minute that they know that you have reserve money, something, a problem will happen in your life that will force you to liquidate it. So it's not really the best way to, you know, uh, uh, the best way is actually to invest in safe stocks. Uh, the ones that are, you know, uh, low risk, uh, um, yeah. not, you know, not the ones. Yeah, we're, that, yeah. yeah, mostly the ones that I do are all like Canadian mutual funds and basically a medium risk. So you can actually designate how much exposure you want that to uh, the marketplace, right? So you minimize yeah. your losses along the way. The good thing is the government will add another 30% to the, you know, what your final, uh, um, you know, uh, investment will be at, you know, just prior to them. Uh, Do uh, they tax it. for it? No, that's no. a great, thing uh because it is educational now there's another one called the rrsp retirement savings fund the second you pull that money out you get taxed 30 percent that's like the iras yeah it, it, like before you even see your money they take 30 percent off of what you get from your investments so it's a double-edged sword they say oh yeah it's a retirement fund but your your retirement fund when you go to collect when you're 65 guess what they charge you that an income tax because you have to claim that on your income tax as a taxable income. 
So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you pull it out early or you pull it out when you're 65, the government's still going to get their fingers in there and pull out 30% taxes off. It. How so, about if the so is it, so it, it makes it really impossible for the Canadian to save for the retirement using this fund when they know the second they pull it out, the, go the government's already got their grubby fingers all over it. Yeah. So it's impossible for you to make any kind of capital gains whatsoever. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, the RSP. It's like taking two steps ahead and one step back. <laughs> More like uh, you know, one step forward, three they, steps they don't back. Where did I, yeah, I said yeah. that? Is my bad. <laughs> yeah, it's even worse. It's, Do they it's not, not give even worth you it. a grace period to reinvest nope. it before it becomes capital gain? Um, say you're transferring it from say one account to a different account. Uh huh. Uh, they uh, or say like a company gives you a buyout. Okay. Like I, I got a buyout from a company I worked for. I had over 24 years there, so I had a private pension. So. I wanted to take my money out of that private pension and put it into my pocket, not theirs. Because at that time, they were kind of losing money on the fund. So mm -hmm. um, they uh, they made, they made held on to it for two years after I left the company. Then I was allowed to put it in a tax shelter in a RRSP, locked in. So now, with that provision in place, I can't touch that money until I'm 55. So that's four years from now. I can actually pull that money out if I want to. And what is the percentage of gain, uh, like that they can oh, get? Oh, they'll well, they'll well. Right now, it's growing. Like uh, my mutual fund for that locked in right now is actually doing pretty good right now. Touch wood, it's doing good. So I figure, you know what? I'm just going to leave it there and let it grow because it seems to be making money right now. But when I turn 55, I do have the option of pulling it out if I want to. But the catch 22 one more time is the second you do that, they want 30% tax taken off. Even after 55? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, so what yep. is the cutoff age that they won't tax you? Is it like here? The there is none. There is none. See here in the state, like if you're after 65, they, you know, it's tax free. You don't have to pay any taxes. Yeah. But see with us. Point. See with us. Okay. You have uh, they they you have to file it as a taxable income. So say like my father, he's eighty three, right? So mm -hmm. at a certain point in those you know uh, retirement years, they say, okay, uh, Mister So and So, Dad, uh, you have to pull out now uh, thirty percent of your investments. So they're actually forcing my father to pull money out. And the second they know, the second they pull money out of his account, they can tax him because it's a taxable income. So all this money my dad's accumulated over the years, he's in his, you know, he's in his early 80s now. That the sounds poor guy's wrong. getting taxed. My dad's getting taxed through the wazoo for all that money he put into RSPs over the years, and you know the government's screwing him on the uh, on the you know on the way out. You know, Jeez. I, I think it's, it's better here in the States. They they're like they're at a certain age, 65. You don't like on like on your IRAs, you don't get taxed yeah. anymore. And you, there's no. Penalty. Yeah, I wish I wish yeah. I wish that was here. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have one investment. It's called a tax free savings account. But the problem is there's no growth in it. They, they, they don't expose it to the open market so you can make capital gains on it. So you got this money going into a tax-free savings account. You can pull it out anytime and not get taxed for it. But the problem is it doesn't get exposed to the mutual fund market to grow. You're you're not making money. And they don't give you the option to choose how you want to invest, like mutual funds or like just... No, they don't give you any options. They don't give you the options. That's the crazy part. Mm -hmm. there's, so, a limit, there's a limit you can deposit on that. that that's uh, right. And they give... And they, uh, cap a limit every year yeah. how much you're allowed to put in it i think here's so like is 15, it, 15, the whole system's rigged i'm telling you just the whole freaking system is rigged right from the bottom up uh -huh. it really is and, it, and it's global too it doesn't matter if you're canadian or australian or english or american or south America. all the system the whole monetary system globally is completely rigged yeah. you, you know, if I, think, I were to invest in something i would invest in the computer chips the the, the, the from Taiwan, 
like the, the ones that they manufacture for all our cell phones, all our computers, everything, that you particular, you know, chip making company, that's where, who I would invest with because it, there's a monopoly on it. And they're the only ones that, you know, most of the, like I'm saying 90% of the countries worldwide use that, those companies from Taiwan to manufacture anything that has a microchip in it. And, you know, they're going to just keep on going up and up and up. And I think this is going to be where most of the money, you know, globally is going to be made, you know, that the, the way the, yeah, the, I, the way I see it, and I hate to be a real pessimist on this, it seems like the way they've basically built the whole entire world global monetary system is rigged against the poor guy and in favor of the rich man. The rich man will yeah. always have the upper hand. You and, know, you know, there was a, way, um, you know, against have, intelligent people. If you, you if know, you have a high IQ, problems will follow you no matter what you do. Yeah. Once they know you have a little bit more intelligence than the average person, they they will put you through hoops and loops just never to get mm -hmm. let you get ahead. I mean, you, that's I, right. I that's you right. They're, they're always pushing us down in order. They, there was so a, they, um, can, they can feed. Oh, I was going to say real quick. There was a famous economist, I forget who it was, uh, but he, he basically, one of his quotes was, uh, and I like this quote, he's like, if most people realized where money comes from, there would be riots in the streets because they just print it. It comes from nowhere. Yeah, it, it's fiat. <laughs> it's our, yeah. yeah, people don't realize all the money that's out there today, it doesn't matter what uh, country the, the, the money is from. It's fiat. It doesn't exist. At a certain level, because I read this. So this is how money is, is justified. Every marriage that when two people get married, the government influxes a, 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 an amount of money for that contract. When a birth happens, a birth certificate has a value. When you write a business plan and submit it to the bank, the bank submits it to the treasury department and they will influx money into the system. It's a scalable factor where they say, okay, if this business is going to thrive, it's going to need, you know, a yay amount of money for it to, you know, be influxed into the system. So it, it becomes a revolving thing where, you know, it's going to make money. So there are things that it, 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 they do print money to allocate it for. So, yeah, I don't know about the, the politicians. Yeah, of course, they can print as much as they want. But for normal human beings, the, the, those bills that, you know, get printed are in their ledgers. This, like that series or those is meant for the, a particular business plan or a human or a, the hmm. thrivability of a family. You know, the, like so there is a, a how am I going to say this? There is a, a ledger where the money is allocated, but there's also a black budget that, you know, we have no knowledge about. But, you know, for the normal thing, yeah. You know, like when a birth happens, it's $100,000 that gets influxed into the economy. Right? I like to I like to make the analogy of our economy running smoothly. Like um, the money acts like oxygen in a system, right? It, ha it works best if it's flowing through the system from one hand to the uh, from, from one hand to the next, right? Uh, when money stays stagnant for too long and in too uh, large of quantity, you see uh, instabilities in the economy. You know, like when when uh, not rich people, but super super rich people hoard their wealth. That's a lot of taxes you're taking away, and then you have to make up those taxes somewhere. So you do regressive tax systems where you kind of nail the the smaller guy you know you you uh increase uh the workers uh you know taxes to make up the difference yeah yeah unfortunately but That's no I, I, this goes back to my point like um even small businesses that don't really seem like they have a function in society they do play a function because they they transfer that money from one hand to another you know it's stimulating local economies. Yeah, it creates a GDP and things like that. And uh, but that's the thing. The, uh, that's the why elites, I love small businesses. Yeah, the, the elites and uh, the, these rich people, um, they, they don't want to lose control. You know, they they want to they want to stay in power. So the the, well, the more the more they that's they're very built, obvious. That's the very more, obvious. Right. Any hierarchy of uh, any hierarchy of top-down power is going to ensure the conditions of its own existence. 
whether the entities themselves are aware of it or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other analogy I had too was um, that, you know, they, they, they have to keep us below so they can control the top. It's always been a power struggle. You know, it doesn't matter if it has to do with the monetary system or oil, gas, whatever, yeah. or the energy sector. And the problem is now, um, one guy used to call it, um, it, it's like corporate fascism, okay? And it's uh, it's showing its ugly head big time, especially in the United States now. You got these special business interests on Wall Street, BlackRock, all these corporations have a huge influence on governments, like where the government almost doesn't even have the control. They got people that they answer to now. Right. So who where, where is the sovereignty here in a nation if if, say, the government of the United States or the government of Canada? Right. Cannot. I can come in and in, in their own country. It's great. Right. I can yeah. donate five dollars to a political candidate, but that's nothing compared to like the millions of super PAC can donate to them. You know, right. Yes. Yeah, the lobby. Yeah. Right. That's where it yeah. all kind of started with the lobby. Yeah. And it's been going on for 100 years. You know, that's what they're doing. That's why that's why they, they want to sh shut down or silence uh, groundbreaking innovation like uh, what you're doing the the uh, the um, zero point energy or the integrity right. just right. it destabilize it destabilizes their system that's and, right so that's why this uh, this conversation usually a conversation like this I wouldn't really want on a show like this but because right. it relates to us in a very deep way. For us I to agree. innovate. So, yes, uh, this is a good conversation to have on a science channel, you know, that we do. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, uh, economics very is very important. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, and that's been, that's a factor that I don't think a lot of inventors take into account, you know, and that's I think mm -hmm. not analyzing the economic situation is a lot of the inventors downfall, in my opinion, because, you know, we, yeah. we see a lot of inventors, they, uh, they either try to go straight to market without open sourcing the science and they just get shut down on every, every angle, you know? And I yeah. think the route is to kind of open source the science behind it and then try to market it, you know, try to come up with something after the fact, well, because if you it, open source it. Yeah. I think a free enterprise is a good thing. Mm. You know, like, you know, look at the Chinese since say 1975 to the present that country has completely transformed itself from basically a real third, you know, dirty third world country. Yeah. Their GDP is and, twice uh, ours. And, yeah. So, you know, like it, it can be done and they were big on free enterprise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, a communist government, but there was a lot of free enterprise there and there was a lot of poor people that became rich. So, right. It's more nuanced. Like, yeah, it's government, but you got to look at a case by case basis. Like, what are they doing individually and what their policies are? You know, you can't just li blanket label it all communists and, and it's all bad. What, what exactly are they doing? And then you can kind of like reverse engineer and say, how can I apply that to an American philosophy, you know, under our uh, constitutional rights and, and abiding by American principles? We're not no, allowed to. Not adaptation. China, China <laughs> buys ports. Go. We're not allowed to do that. Yeah. China yeah. goes around buying yeah. ports, puts their people in place, and then they take over an industry in other countries. Yeah. We're not allowed it's, to do that in the U.S. It's, Trust me. Uh, it's a kind of soft power. We like what you see in more. the United States is, yeah, we see a hard power with the United States, but with them, they'll go over and they'll build ports and and build you know infrastructure and then kind of uh, uh, get their power that way. You know, well, get yeah, their input. that's what I'm saying. We're not allowed to do that here in the U.S. We're, we're not yeah. allowed to put our influence in that way. We always have to backdoor things to the CIA to get anything. Right, done. right. We're, no, we're you're right. You're absolutely right. You're just not allowed to do it. Yeah. You know, that's why a lot of the countries around us that should be, you know, parts of the U.S. aren't. And it really sucks. We tie our own hands and we get screwed by it. Yeah. So. No, I agree. I agree. That's a that's an apt assessment. I think the big <laughs> problem now is with our governments that they're getting too imposing on the family, where it's mm -hmm. like you feel like there's a government agent sitting in your family room. You know what I right. mean? Watching everything that you do. And that scares me because that's 
basically totalitarianism. You know, you know, yeah. Like, well, that, that mean, comes in cycles, though. It, it keeps coming, you know what I mean? Every 10, mm -hmm. 15 years, it comes in. If, if you lived in the 50s and then came to now, oh, my God, the whole world would be completely different. What they complained about then was nothing compared to what it is now. Yeah, hmm. they'd you know? be horrified. Yeah. They'd be horrified to see what we have now. Yeah. yeah. You know, to deal with. Oh, if it's, they saw, you know, what they're pushing in these kids' schools and stuff like that and their bathrooms. Oh, they'd be rolling in their them. graves. Oh my God! Yeah. The school would be shut down. They wouldn't have any students there. Like yeah. what, I what? See, what I see yeah, happening yeah. in the public school system now, especially you know, in Canada and the U.S., that. it's just horrifying what they're doing now. Man, the like, school here are it's a institution not of education. It's an that's institution right. of criminalization. Yeah, you know, they, they're teaching people how to be uh, um, how to be uh, good criminals. Did they do the opposite? The, the, they try to criminalize kids at a young age in order for them to get their fingerprints, get them, uh, get their picture, get their whole like you know data before they're even adults. Do you understand? Well, that like, yeah, 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 the social security. I, uh, I, I went and that's I, an aspect I, I didn't even. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. You know what they of education not you guys are running an institution of criminalization why would you you know if a kid is in the hallway they write them up if a kid is talking like you know in class yeah it's like being in jail and it's, yeah it really is and then so many write-ups they send you to something called iss i don't know what that stands for but it's like it's like a for juvies it's like even you know, like even when i went to high school you and know I'm even like, when i went to high school uh if you got in a fight, if somebody came up to you and started punching you and you didn't do anything to them, you both got uh, suspended. No, oh, yeah. Yeah, and well. you know, I was I was giving them some theorems at the school. I'm like, do you, do you teach this in your school? And she looked at me like, like, what the heck am I? Are you talking about? I'm like, this is an education system. Should you be focusing on this rather if the kid is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, doing this or talking to their friend or passed a note or laughed at a joke or this or that? I'm like, are you guys an a, a, an education system or just like a a parole system? And, and you know, in a way, and they got pissed off at me. They got so angry at me. I'm like, if you guys don't, you know, step up your game, I'm gonna call the Department of Education, and I'm gonna uh, file a lawsuit against you if you guys are not, you know, because this man, I, I went yeah. off on them. Like uh, wow. going with the social insurance number, or your social security number. Know how the banks use your social security number? Okay, mm -hmm. when when you're born, they issue you, you know, your social insurance number or whatever, right? Well, when the government wants to uh, borrow money from the private banking corporations, they have to put a bond. Guess who the bond is? You, your children. <laughs> they, wow. they issue your, yep, they issue your social insurance number to the private banking corporations as a bond. Wow. Oh, That's wow. what we are. We yeah. are a bond. We are a commodity. Mean? Dude, that's really depressing. You're depressing it, me with that. Sorry. Oh. Hey, you know what? Hey, I just call Oh, no, no just, you're good. You're good. Just, I, I needed to call, hear it. I needed to hear it. Just, just call me Let's Dr. Let's get back Doom. to having no more money for inventors. Just call me <laughs> yeah. Dr. Doom. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Re review the SIE hey, Series my, my 7. Uh, for financial, oh. like to become a financial advisor. And you will, will like, your your hair will turn gray. On the thing, like I, I reviewed that test. I was going to become a financial advisor, and so I studied for the test. But after I studied, I didn't. I, I you know, I felt like I was going to become a merchant of of uh, of death, not a a, a person that's going to be doing good because the laws and regulations that they have, it gives these uh, uh, institutions like ultimate power over the human being. Like you, you become pretty much God, you know, whether you decide a person's fate, a family's future, a business's, uh, you know, whether it's a good idea and how would you know? Just well, look how many put these celebrities on pedestals. They think they can get away with anything and but they you're can. Not understanding. It's, it's a stupid test that anybody could pass. And then it gives you the ultimate power to dictate people's lives. This is what it is. And I didn't know if I was gonna, I felt guilty if I was going to take, you know, pass and, and, and dictate people's lives. How would I know, you know, whether you deserve that or you don't? Do you understand or your idea is good or not? It's just, it's, if I like the person, they look okay that, yeah, I give them the loan. If not, you know, if somebody, you know, I don't. And it, it, there's no 
guidelines. There's no rules. It's just my, because I passed the test. I got the certificate, this license. I get to dictate the rules. You get it? There's no, there's no merits behind anything. There's not like when they say it's an, uh, 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 somebody's going to underwrite your loan. Well, guess what? The underwriter, there is no criteria. It's just if they like you. That's just the criteria. Wow. Oh, okay. I see what you're I'm saying. Just so it's on their, on their whim. I'm just going to yeah. I'm just, I'm just scoot up for a quick smoke. You guys carry on. It's, it's, it's Gerald's really here on like you. Hey, Gerald. Can What's you up, hear Gerald? me now? My mic is uh, there, too. Hey, um, everybody. Can you I, hear I, me? I can only have six people on. I don't have the paid account, uh -huh. so I'm limited to six right now. Would but, you like uh, if I if you'd like I I could step out for a little bit and watch if, you know No, I just want to just want to say something to you to respond. Yes. The the education system, the problem with the education system these days, they do exactly the opposite of what they need to do because they don't teach it. what they need to do is teach economy and classes like that, but no instead they teach like that world culture shit and <laughs> they, create, they create confusion in the kids minds. Confusion is exactly the opposite of what you need to have to succeed. If you don't know what you want, you, you're never going to succeed and you, you're never going to be. Right. You need critical survive. thinking skills. And that's what they do not teach. Can, critical can you hear me now? Skills. Yeah. And yeah. they're going to hit the wall when they, they come to the uh, commercial sector, when they get out of school. They, they're not get, they we're not preparing them, you know. No, not at all. They don't even teach them how a credit card works, your bank works, you know, check. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what? anything. I hate to say it this way, but most people actually don't understand how the banking system works. Did you know that on the day of your birth, if you were born at, say, seven pounds, that the Roman Catholic Church, because of the order with the queen, when it was all back to Magna Carta, was supposed to give you your weight in gold as of the day of your birth. <laughs> but because they set up this big system with social insurance numbers you're now a dead man's bones until you claim yourself as a human being as blood bone and flesh and blood that runs through it that's why i have no id i have uh no license no nothing i can't buy a house i can't buy a car nothing because I got my original social insurance number from the Vatican when I was 12 years old and it was put in a safe. That safe's gone. <laughs> wow. So, so now I can't get ID. There's a mechanism where I can get like a temporary ID, but I still can't do any trading, buying of houses, nothing. Everybody's been locked out. Where do well, you live? That, that's the thing. So, is the mark that everybody talks about, you know, and I, I know not everybody believes not, and I get it, but is the mark something that actually is imprinted in your hand? Or is it something that you have in your mind, like your social insurance number, and you use your right hand to write it down every time you get a job, or every time you have to open up a bank account, or apply for a loan, Wait, or, or... By mark, you're talking about the terminology? There's more using? than terminology. There's actual a law that most people don't huh. even think about or understand. Right, See, but I understand they they phrase things very specifically, and that's what you're going into? Yes, because the government runs under maritime law, and we mm. think that they run under common law, but they don't, mm. and that's how they catch us. It's that's how they're all floating in. Are you talking about the Canadian government, U.S. government? No, or? all around the world, dude. It's a worldwide the yeah, U.S. government does it, yeah. All the yeah, social insurance numbers and all your guys' security uh, numbers are all, they come from the Vatican. They're all being held in Rome. That's crazy. I believe it. Nah. There's a whole system that most do people some research don't understand on that for sure. that's behind the scenes. And if you don't play along with that system, you're not able to buy or sell anything. Hmm. I don't have a social insurance number anymore. I can't buy or sell anything what, at all. What it's country hard. are you in? What's that? What country are you in? I'm in Canada. Okay. But don't kid yourself. The states is exactly the same. Go get. Yeah, no, I've known people who got locked out of the system. 
Yeah, I'm locked out completely. There's because uh, like, there was a situation where I knew somebody, and uh, it turns out they were adopted from South America, and it was a legal adoption. They didn't go through the proper channels. They just kind of took the baby and got like illegal credentials. And because of that, the baby grew up and she didn't have a way into the system if she loses, you know, those, uh, if she had to like get like a, a social security card, she couldn't. Yeah, yeah. I have a whole binder. I studied this for about eight years. That, like, I have a question. If all of us go to the Vatican and say, hey, cough up our money, this is the law. What, there what, hasn't, what it... there, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Lily. No, no, go I'm ahead. saying if, if all of us go to the Vatican, like a group of us, like you're saying, like our, our, our identities are locked up in the Vatican. Yep. But, you know, if you go as one individual, they'll call you insane. But if you go as a group, they can't say oh, the whole group is insane. And you're, 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 you're on to something. You're on to something. Get around. That... Sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, I'm sorry. No, no go, you ahead, go ahead. Ben. Okay, so this is how they get around that. You're not classified as alive. You try going into a courtroom and telling them that... When they ask you for your name, you say, I am the trustee that holds that name. I am flesh and blood, or I'm flesh and bone, and blood runs through it. And that judge will get up and run out of that courtroom so fast, it'll make your head spin. Because you now have declared that you're alive. And he can't allow you to do that, because if you do that, he doesn't get paid for being in so, court. So if I pick up my shoe and I smack him in the head with it, what happens? Is he going to? You're going to get like, charged. Well, but yeah, if, I'm dead. If, I'm dead. Are you going to charge a dead person if they think of me? <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. You no. Know? The way that their law system works, they classify you as dead, so that every time you make a mistake and you go to court and you say, "I plead guilty," they take your name and they attach it to the Vatican, and they get paid a piece of your gold behind the scene that you're not aware of. I'll tell going you, back to what you were saying, I going back to what you were saying, I'm in, 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 in trouble, but I was requested to go to court because one of my kids and through the school got in trouble. And I went there and I took the constitution with me, the whole, the constitution, the book. And I told the judge, I abide by the rules of this book, not whatever rules you have in front of you. And she had to drop the case. I didn't know what, you know, somebody told me that this would be a good idea. Because, I, you know, I don't know exactly every rule in the Constitution, but the rules in the Constitution abide by maritime laws. So you're absolutely right about that. And, you know, explain to me later. But when I held the Constitution in my hand, I told her I abide by this book, not, but what, not, but, not on what you have in front of you. Uh, uh, within like 30 minutes, they had to drop the case and they dropped the case. So That's interesting. I've never seen the Constitution used that way. The last time that uh, uh, I was involved in a court in the States, and it wasn't me personally, it was a family member, um, they had issues because the Constitution didn't work for them. They yeah, were literally I, bypassed I, completely because of the way that maritime law works and the way that the court system works. If you, when, when they arrest you and they say, uh, um, you have a right to remain silent, and then you say, can you use against you in a court of law and when they ask you do you understand these rights you absolutely 100 million percent say no and they're gonna say what don't you understand about these rights and what you say to them after that is me and a thousand lawyers could take 10 years to take apart this law and still wouldn't understand these rights because what you're saying is i don't believe in the rights that you're dishing out because what you're dishing out is part of your court system, not part of common law and the constitution. There's a big difference. Exactly. This is why when the, that person that told me, you tell them that you follow the constitution, not the laws that they have in front of them. Because the judge has some piece of paper in front of them and this is what they're, they, you know, they're applying on you as law. And that is not right. And so, but the constitution is right. So when you tell them, I fall, I abide by the constitutional law, not by the laws that you have in front of you, it like mm -hmm. discredits. And all those, ex all those exceptions that they make are all based on precedent, you know, like, because somebody got away with it before they can get away with it again. Like that doesn't make any sense. <laughs>
Yeah, it kind of doesn't work that way. It really goes down to the exact words you say from the point of arrest to the point of standing before the judge. Oh, because okay. Also, there's something with when they handcuff you uh, and you put your hands behind your back, Is it, it, it follows a, a different protocol when they put the handcuffs in front of you. You know, like the, hand, like the handcuffs in front of your back are a key Freema Freemason uh, slavery ritual in order to walk you in shame to the court. Okay, so this is what I did. I'm so skinny to the point where I could flip the handcuffs, you know, over and, and you know, have them in the front. So they handcuffed me to the back and I went, you know, like, you know, and I, I put them to the front. And they're like, oh, you're not allowed to do that. I'm like, okay, take them back and put them back on. They did it again. I did it flipped again. I'm like, you know, we, we could do this a thousand times, you know? Yeah. I, if you're going to handcuff me, my hands are going to be in front, not on, in the back. And they were so pissed off at me. But, yeah, yeah I, I almost got a beating for that one because I have a dislocated, messed up hand, right? So I just broke the thumb, so to speak, and just pulled the cuff off. It doesn't matter how tight you put them on. Uh, yeah. And I, I had pulled it off and I was scratching my nose and the cop didn't like that so much. So I, I did that. I gave them yeah. the cuff back, mm. located my thumbs. and I But I mean, them. that was a long time ago when I was a kid, but I studied <laughs> the law because I realized... I got when I was young, I got pulled over in a truck. We had just painted this truck, did the motor up, put Krieger SST mags on it, new stereo and everything. But I was going through a divorce, and my ex had called the cops and said I had a gun in the truck. So they surrounded the truck, and I was driving it to go get it insured. And they surrounded the truck with guns, and it was a big deal. And then uh, when they got me down on the ground, and handcuffed me and they would put me in the car and they read me my rights. I told them exactly what I told you. And they brought me to the station and they tried to read me my rights again. And I told them, I said, look, I'm my father's son. I was born from, you know, what did I say? I was born from bone and flesh and I have blood running through it. God is my father and I don't listen to your rule. I've done nothing wrong. Release me. Not only did I get released, but... I got asked to stay for five minutes so the captain of the force could talk to me. They released me. I was out the front door. The captain came out, apologized, and asked me nicely not to sue his detachment. Because if I had, it might have shut them down. I didn't quite understand what was going on at the time. I kind of had a gist. And I told him, I said, I'm not, I'm not about that. I believe in the law. I just don't believe... In the abuse of the law, See, and like, I left them all in the law. Abuse. Hmm. No, my dad Crazy, did yeah. absolutely nothing wrong. Like one of and them, was because we we got out of the club at two fifteen instead of two o'clock. Cops were standing out there, like, "Oh, it's past club hours, and we're gonna arrest everybody that's coming out." Like, really? Yeah, that's, that's that's called a curfew, and that's yeah, but we, uh, that's uh, that's insane. you know that's communist. Well, yeah, oh, right. You can look at the cop and say, go right ahead. I'll have your badge and I'll for sure. with for everything that they own. Do you understand? You right what you Absolutely nothing wrong. We just stepped out and they arrested everybody. Like, it's like, yeah. really? Like, what you did know, we do? Yeah. George, George Carlin, the comedian, had the best saying. He goes, it's not that you have rights, you have privileges. Limited yeah. privileges. And every year... Yeah. Well, those privileges are getting taken away from you. And right. see, here's the wake thing. Up. I don't believe in privileges. I believe in rights because I, I believe we were all born under God. And any man that tries to tell me what to do, I don't care if you have a gun. I don't care if you have a bazooka. I don't care what you have on you. You can go outside and play hide and go yourself, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't... I don't attest to that if you ask me to do something nicely of course i will that why wouldn't I? I you know i'm not doing anything wrong but you go and tell me to do something that's another story right i don't believe that any man should force another man or a woman force another woman person whatever uh their will upon another that's wrong you ask them and they don't want to do it back off being a cop and all that other crap like, I can't imagine what they go through, but they know, unfortunately, that the public doesn't know the law. And unfortunately, the public doesn't know how 
to treat them because they know the law. And if they did, then these guys wouldn't be acting like stormtroopers and abusing yeah. their authority. See, I believe yeah. in the law. I just don't believe in the abuse of the law. I think that's... You know what? I, I can go as far as uh, believing in... A, a but the law isn't system. always right. Yeah. Well, this is uh, called abuse of power, right? And yeah. You're seeing it yeah. over and over and over, and it doesn't matter what country you live in. I, I, I do believe I, in having a structured, uh, you know, lawful society. I do believe that. But the problem is too many people at the top are abusing the privileges. Yeah. And they're putting out too many laws, which is making yeah. it like a control system. Yeah. 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 And that, that's where our society and you know, like great civilizations have come and gone, you know, for whatever reason. And yeah, nothing's uh, stagnant. Nothing's and, stagnant. And, you know what? We're not immune to it either. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mike, and life is about adaptation. Out, so Mike Doss can come in because I no, want to hear what he's can, talk can, about. Uh, can step out instead, uh, is Sorry, the Sorry, I cut you off there, Lulu. No, no, I was saying uh, I'm going to step out, uh, but I'll, I'll be still listening in. Uh, so Mike Doss can join because he's been, I think, one, you know, joined <laughs> for the past like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, but I'll okay. still watch you guys. But uh, how do uh, I'm going to step out, but watch the show. <laughs> Backstage. Yeah, you can still go in the live chat there. Yeah. All right. I don't know how to get out of here. Hold on. Yeah. Just, uh, log. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead, Phil. Okay. Yeah. I'd yeah. Like your, uh, here's my. Yeah, I'm, I'm limited to six people, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, I. I am actually not a, like a full subscriber to stream. Hey guys. I'm using the free software. Hey Mike. So, Mike. Hey Mike. Did your research, yeah. huh, Gerald? Yeah, there's a What's few that? people out there that have done what Gerald has done. I can and tell you did your research, Gerald. Yeah, I, I've uh, I wrote it uh, actually on paper so that I could memorize it. It really is well, they, depressing. No one, no one nice. classifies you. committed it you. to memory. I like it. That. Is, it's called a free man walking. Yeah, but if you use that term, you'll be classified as a terrorist. Yeah. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> you can't even use sovereign citizen anymore either. It's the same thing. They classify uh, that as... You know, that's the problem with the justice system is these days the, the judges, they have too much discretion, you know? How can you... Oh, yeah, you can watch your mouth in there, man. One, one thing I, I really don't understand is the hate crime. How can you tell what people had on his mind? While he attacks somebody else, you know, a little respect and humble the what do you call it, humbleness. Yeah, yeah hate you know, crimes just hate, another. Hate is done. It's not an action. It's a state of. It's an emotional state of mind. So those can, hate crime laws. Those are just another form of control from the top down. That's all they are. Yeah, exactly. and they can be used too indiscriminately. They're such a load of crap. Yes. Yeah, I know. So they just they just add that to to add like discretion to the judge in case the the, the judge doesn't like you, then you're just gonna say, Oh, you, you just did a hate crime and we're gonna double your sentence or whatever. You know? Good luck getting me in the courtroom, I'll say to that. Because <laughs> I'm not standing before no judge. I'll never allow a judge hey. ever allow a judge to to reside over me again. You know what he is? He's a civil servant. Girl. He he's a uh, he's not even a he's trust. A front for you. He's a he's a he's a front man for the banks. Because yeah, you know what he is? Ones. All he is is there to make sure procedure runs through. When he opens yep. his big mouth that steps outside procedure, you guys need to step on it like a bug. Well, you got a point there, bro. Wow. As long as you know judges, what? most judges follow that <laughs> protocol, Gerald. I mean, come on. what's that? They're, they're, most judges do do that. They, yep, they, they stick to, to the case. If, if they, they, do, whole, really, the whole job. they work for the banks. <laughs> if They're you're the able man. to declare yourself as a living being, do you realize what's going to happen to that Occasionally judge? when you have a judge that's corrupt and they don't stick to the case and they get biased. And that happened here in my county recently. They just, uh, the female judge, I don't remember her name. But she, there are certain words they that they included her for, for being biased against the case, uh, you know, onto the, I guess it was the plaintiff side. She was biased. She lost hey, it. Mike, if there are certain words that you repeat to the judge, he'll get up and he'll walk out. And he'll come back in. You repeat those words again. 
he'll get up and walk out and will not come back. Because on the third time, if he comes and sits down and you repeat those same words, you are now declared living flesh and he's screwed. That's That will tear apart the whole court I've system. heard about those words. I don't remember what they are, but I've heard of them. I am bone and flesh and blood runs through it. I am a living oh, that's being. Right. And I hold that <laughs> name in trust. And you watch their, I'm telling you, yeah. it's crazy. You know what it is, is scripture, signing your name, that's necromancy, okay? Yeah. So you're saying you're dead every time you sign your name or write in necromancy. Well, kind of. You're a bond. You're, you're, a, bond. you're a bond. Well, but think you, about this, okay? Is, uh, is, 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 it, is, is it in, is it in, is it in script? Your it goes back to when you, uh, back to when the ships were leaving and you would go to the captain because the captain would be sitting there by the plank and you'd have to make your mark to get onto the ship so he could take you to travel to wherever because those ships didn't always make it. So what would happen is, is you're giving your mark oh, and anything right, that right. happens to you signs away your life. That's so right. now yeah. you're dead man I I remember reading about that. Yeah, you, yeah, you, and you you're on a little ship. More, more detail than I do on this topic. <laughs> Yeah, so Correct. because you make your mark, familiar. you've now literally signed away your life. You're no longer alive, and they own you. So you have well, to. Okay, well, as soon as you get on that vessel, you you might end up dead. You know, that's that's how risky. Yeah, it is. exactly. So that's how they based all this law. It's crazy, but that's literally what they believe. And if yeah. they believe it, hey, they're the ones that run it. How right? many people? How many people in the system so actually are aware people. of this, though? Uh, quite a few, actually. There's a. Are they like concentrated at the very top? Uh, kind of, kind of. Yeah. There's a very special ID called the Sovereign Citizen Card. Very, very hard to get your hands on. It takes a long time, and you have to go through all kinds of channels. But once you do, you can actually declare yourself a small country, and you're tax free. Well, each, forever. each ship is a. Wait, country. so wherever you walk, that's your country. Um, on the sea, or do you have to be working. like in a specific place? No, you don't have to be in a specific place, but it doesn't quite work like that. It's more like your flag, your declaration, who you are, and who you, what name you hold in trust, and that's kind of how it works. It's a whole yeah. legal mechanism that's put into play that declares that you're your own country. I don't think I fully understand. I'm gonna have to do some research. Every on this, vessel but... at sea is a country. Yes, but because you've made your mark, you're now just dead man's bones on someone else. That's else's why they vessel. focused on building carriers because it's literally a country. I know this it's sounds really. crazy. There's more detail than that. According like I to said, maritime law, and you know, there's things about sea lanes. Certain sea lanes cannot be. Uh, you can't be on there more than ten minutes. So if you remember back a few years ago, China every now and then they put aircraft in the air. And they fly into no, no no fly zone. That's the lanes I'm talking about on the sea. They exist yeah. in the air as well above this yeah. that same sea area. So when they do fly in those areas, and they don't stay longer than ten minutes, they get out at minute nine because they know the law, the the maritime law. They're just scaring people. I'll give you guys a little tip. When you see a country making a, a press conference, say uh, Trudeau or even your country's head of state. Look at the uh, uh, flags, how they're folded, and if there's gold frill, that's mm -hmm. showing. If the gold mm -hmm. frill is showing, that means what they're speaking is maritime law, and they're actually going to do something. Have if you there's no the frill, frill, hang this on a second. Wild. There's no frill showing. That means that they're bullshitting, and they're talking mm -hmm. about a cross between common law and maritime law, and you have to watch. It's almost like... Uh, not being sneaky, but eh, they're not telling you the truth either. Now, what was it that you asked me, Mike? Oh, have you heard of quantum grammar? No, that I haven't heard. Quantum of. grammar. Have you heard the name Russell J. Gould? Yes. Or David Wynn Miller? Oh yeah, David Wynn Miller. Okay. That well, guy's like my legal hero, man. All right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Who are these guys? Grammar. David, David Wynn Miller, Wynn Miller was the grammar. first. Yeah, Russell he was J. the guy. Gould that, the postmaster general. Right now, he took exactly. over the world but in 1999. Now, Nobody knows this. He did David it with Wynn Miller died. and the Vatican and all the seaports. He went there and was with quantum grammar uh, contract, 
and he uh, found some errors in the uh, previous contracts between the Royal British Royal Empire and the West, particularly. And yeah, uh, he went and fixed it. I don't know why he went and did that. Well, you know that C symbol with the two lines to it. <laughs> yeah, that is a British syntax that belongs to the Queen or the Royal Empire. And it's on all your, you know, leases and purchase contracts in this, in this country. So oh, a percentage of, of money of those transactions goes to the queen, including the parking lots, the parking meters, and all that stuff related. Well, to she the she ain't no queen of mine. She's dead now, and I don't and I don't uh, acquire to that prince that. Well, that ended in 1999, thanks to Russell J. Gould. <laughs> he went with gold coin and proper contract to the Vatican at the right time and the right day and the right second. And he was the only one. And he became the new postmaster general because the okay. new okay, renew your every uh, 100 years. Whoa. Even though he was the postmaster general, he could have unleashed. Okay, he's the, the guy they put the on TV in the, in the orange jumpsuit and declared him, and this was in the 90s, the Bushes did this. Story. Sorry, guys. You know what? They, Not everybody they, understands what we're talking about, Mike. That's yeah, I, I need so a yeah, little bit of People saw him, though, on TV in the orange jumpsuit. Well, I, I can't him. understand anything when somebody talks over somebody. So you call yeah, somebody sorry, talk. guys. Yeah, so they put him on TV uh, as, a, as a, a defector to Islam, American defector to Islam in an orange jump, jumpsuit. And they beat the hell out of him for uh, for taking the seat of postmaster general, and then they finally let him go. And now what? he's uh, doing well. And he's the postmaster general, the new postmaster general, and he invalidated it, the old contract between the queen because their their grammar was incorrect. Explain real quick what a postmaster general does or what their role is. They control the oh. sea lanes and seaports where armies and and oh. and, 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 uh, and naval forces can fight their wars. Oh wow! Yeah. He can change laws, and because he knew he could, like he how to whether a war takes place or not, it, because he knew the esoteric ways of how to acquire that role. He's a good lawyer. He got it. Like you said, he he arrived at a specific time at a specific date. Yeah, well, the the person he's talking His about, partner David Wynn Miller, was he a, studied was under? Good. Yeah, he studied under David Wynn Miller, and David Wynn Miller was the one that figured all this out. The guy was a genius. He was yeah, firing he was it, all cylinders. He knew a bunch of okay. languages too, right? And what exactly did he figure out? Well, David Wim Miller, apparently, you know, he was like a savant of some kind. And they, he said himself that he thinks he was cloned. But anyway, he knew like a bunch of languages. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, like a lot. He thought, no, I mean, he knew them all. Was it all of them? Yeah, except for two, I think. Yeah, they were dialects like, like, that, uh, a lot of languages. Right? Yeah, there were dialects that weren't written down. He, he so, had a he's the guy who put together quantum grammar, and De, uh, Russell J. Gould was his main partner in this whole. So, so yeah, this whole he project. had an absolute photographic memory, and and he used the quantum grammar to 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 get the seat as postmaster general. Oh, I see. Yeah, you they, you they needed to bring a certain amount of gold coins, yeah, and okay. there had to be certain types of gold coins. Let me look that up. That's interesting. That is really interesting. At all the at all the sea major oh. seaports, the Vatican is one, and there's a there's like one in Gibraltar, Spain, and there's all these certain seaports around the world where you have to go and 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 take that seat. That seat controls the sea lanes and 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 the shipping and, and import okay. export everything. Hang on a sec, Mike. There's a little more to it than that. David Wynn actually went to Rome. And they had to let him in, and he was actually in the Vatican vault because but, he figured out how maritime law, anybody and everybody who can figure this out can actually go and access the Vatican's vault because they're under obligation to follow this law to the T. And he understood through what Ben had said, the esoteric symbols how to literally go there and they had to open it up to them. It's just like if I went there and showed them certain things, they have to let me in too. Oh, by the way, David Wynn Miller was a Supreme Court judge. Like he was like top of the line, top, top judge. Of one of the top uh, judges. Like not just an average judge. He was like, like Supreme Court judge. 